So good afternoon, those who have joined us. I'm just going to wait a few moments um, because there's sort of a big backlog of people joining up and I can see the numbers increasing and we'll start once, once uh, we get all the people into the webinar. Okay, terrific. It looks like we've reached a, a relatively steady number. So welcome to the third webinar in our ad hoc uh, Australian Electricity Market Initiative webinar series. Um, my name's Gordon Leslie. I'm a lecturer at the Department of Economics at Monash University and a core member uh, of Monash Business School's electricity focused research group, the Australian Electricity Market Initiative or AEMI. So um, this, this webinar is, is run out of the Monash Energy Institute and the AEM, AEMI. Uh, it'll run for one hour with approximately 30 minutes or so of presentation uh, and time for some Q&A. This webinar will be recorded and once post-production occurs, will be available at the Monash Energy Institute webinar page for this, uh, for this particular webinar. So it's going to be my pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Severin Borenstein, but before I go into more details of the talk, I'd like to recognise that we are meeting on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation. Uh, well, I, I am and many Australians are, Severin's in California, um, but I, I pay my respects to, to their elders past, present and emerging and express a warm welcome to any of those who are joining us today. So first, some background for our local Australian audience. So a major focus of today's presentation We'll focus on how utility fixed costs are recovered via electricity tariffs. Deciding on how to design tariffs to recover these infrastructure costs has substantial equity and efficiency consequences. And such consequences are incredibly relevant to our land down under, which has rapidly become the land of rooftop solar with world leading per capita rooftop solar adoption, in part driven by the incentives created by our network tariff regime and the private economic benefits from net metering. We also have a looming large infrastructure program if we're going to achieve a timely transition to a low carbon intensity grid, whereby we'll need to build out and strengthen both our transmission and distribution networks, plus making our networks more robust to more frequent extreme weather conditions. Uh, for example, with respect to bushfires. So reviewing the design of electricity tariffs and fixed cost recovery is a conversation we need to have here. So this context, not a lot of it changes if you substitute terms such as bushfires for wildfires, the land down under for the Golden State, and that is Australia with California. So it is with great pleasure and interest that I introduce Professor Severin Borenstein from the University of California, Berkeley. Severin is an economist at the Haas School of Business and faculty director of the Energy Institute at Haas. He has a long history of important public roles regarding California's emissions market, their air quality board, and recently was appointed to the governing board of the California Independent System Operator. However, and I see I've got a few of them in here, students of my energy economics class will simply know him as the author of every second paper that I assign as pre-reading each week. Um, so Severin will be discussing his report with his co-authors, Meredith Fowley and Jim Slee, who, who joins us today and will assist in the Q&A, uh, designing electricity rates for an equitable energy transition. And so this is a paper that focuses on rate design in the Californian context and uh, amongst other things, highlights some concerns as they relate to lower income households. So uh, Severin, please take it away and audience members, uh, please enter your questions in the Q&A window and they'll get either addressed by Jim or Severin as you go or, or be left uh, for the Q&A if it's more of a discussion type question. Thank you, Severin. Excellent. Um, thank you. It's lovely to be in, at Monash again. I was there 35 years ago. I wish I were there in person again, but uh, uh, we'll have to make do. Uh, and Gordon, thank you for inviting us uh, to present this paper. Uh, this paper starts from this uh, uh, graph, and that is a recognition that prices in California are high and uh, actually are once again rising. They had sort of come closer to the national average and uh, in the last few years have started really rising again. And looking into why that is, and uh, uh, what the implications of it are. Uh, before I go further, I want to note we're going to focus on three, the three large utilities in California, San Diego Gas and Electric, Southern California Edison, and Pacific Gas and Electric. Uh, and for those of you who haven't spent a lot of time covering the, or looking at the, the map, electricity markets, 
this is where they are. Uh, PG&E covers a huge amount of land and serves about 5 million customers. Southern California Edison serves about 5 million. San Diego Gas and Electric serves about 1.2 million. Pacific Core is also, and Liberty are also on this map, but uh, each of them serve very, very few customers. Those are not heavily populated parts of the state. So what we're gonna do in this paper is we're gonna ask why are California's volumetric electricity rates so high? Um, and we're going to find out that it's primarily not because it's actually expensive to supply electricity to customers at this point. That is, the going forward incremental cost of supplying electricity is pretty small, is pretty low relative to the price. In fact, we're going to find that residential prices are two to three times the level of the incremental cost. We're also going to dig into who's paying this co these costs, and what we're going to find is that increasingly the costs are being paid by households at the lower end of the income spectrum, uh, and that uh, the costs are being borne by people who actually have the least ability to bear them. And then we're going to go from being descriptive to trying to be a little more productive and and say, well, how could we, might we be able to recover these costs in a more efficient and equitable way? And we propose a couple of approaches, one that's uh, pretty straightforward and one that's a, a little more novel and talk about how we might implement these in ways that could improve the efficiency of rate rec of cost recovery and the equity of cost recovery. So I'm an economist, so we have to start out with a little bit of basic economics. And that is that ideally, um, we would like electricity prices to reflect the social marginal cost of electricity consumption and the fact that that varies over time. Uh, so when you consume a little more electricity, we would like the price to signal to you, the customer, this is what it's costing society for you to consume that extra electricity and to, rec to reflect that in your decision-making. So if you value it more than the cost of producing that ad additional electricity, then we'd like you to consume it. Now, this is time varying because the cost of electricity, providing electricity changes over time. And because electricity isn't storable, uh, that means that the, the cost changes, the price actually changes and social, meaning that it's not just the cost of generating the electricity, but also takes into account the externalities, the pollution effects of the electricity consumption. So we're going to do an analysis that incorporates the full social marginal cost, including pollution. So as I said, the, that captures all of the incremental costs that electricity consumption imposes, uh, fuel costs, pollution impacts, and some other costs uh, that we'll be digging into. The good news is that if you can charge prices that reflect social marginal costs, consumers in deciding whether to use more electricity or not can trade off their own usage versus the societal costs and come to a, a, usage, a consumption choice that actually reflects the value, the maximizing the value that society is getting from that electricity. And so we start out estimating this efficiency benchmark, this social marginal cost for these three large investor owned utilities in California. And then we compare it to price and we think about, well, how big is the gap and what can we do about it? The first part of the analysis looks at analyzing social marginal cost. Uh, this is, uh, there's a lot of uh, digging into data behind here. But I'll just say that a big piece of it is the actual cost of producing the energy. Part of it is the emissions cost, the, the greenhouse gases. Part of it is the additional capacity you need at peak times, uh, whether it's generation capacity, transmission capacity, or distribution capacity, if people are choosing to consume a little bit more at those peak times. There's a little sliver you can almost see that is ancillary services. If you're if you're an uh, 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 electricity market aficionado, and then when once you produce the electricity and send it through the transmission lines, you lose some of it, particularly on the distribution lines. Uh, there are uh, there are losses in sending it through the lines, 
And so we incorporate those as well. And those turn out to be quite significant because when you think carefully about this analysis, it's the marginal losses that matter. And it turns out that marginal losses actually go up with the load on the system. And so during peak times, you get especially high marginal losses. What we're showing in this graph is the average social marginal cost. It varies hour to hour, but we're showing you the average uh, for each of these years. One of the things worth noting is that social marginal cost in California has actually been declining over the last few years. And that's partially because the grid has been getting cleaner. You can see that the greenhouse gas component, both the paid for through our cap and trade market and the uncovered, uh, the total has been getting smaller over time. Uh, and we've been, we've been getting cheaper and cheaper renewable energy. So the energy component has been shrinking as well. PG&E is going to be sort of our base case for what I'm going to talk about today, because PG&E is the middle case of the three utilities in many ways. Uh, and uh, it is also the largest of the utilities. Uh, this is our analysis for uh, PG&E from 2010 to 2019. And what you see here is that over time, uh, the social marginal cost has actually been falling, as we just noted. This line is simply reflecting that bar chart. The rate for standard customers, which we refer to as non-care, care is the program in California that gives lower rates to low-income customers. The rate for standard customers has been going up. And because since around 2015, the rate for low income customer has have been tied to the rate for standard at a fixed percentage discount, that's been going up as well. You can see right off the bat here that the rate for standard customers is about three times social marginal cost. And even the rate for the low income customers is about twice social marginal cost. So we see a huge gap here. Here are the graphs for Southern California Edison and San Diego Gas and Electric. Southern California Edison has somewhat lower rates, though still well above our calculation of their social marginal cost. Uh, and San Diego has much higher rates. Uh, San Diego rates are the highest in the state. And you can see that they are well over triple the social marginal cost. And the, their, even their low income customers are paying a very large premium over social marginal cost. So this is pretty concerning. Uh, we have prices that are not doing what I talked about a few minutes ago. That is, they aren't really reflecting the cost to society that you, that you impose when you consume a bit more electricity. So, that means that people aren't necessarily making good decisions about consuming electricity. In fact, they're receiving a price signal that is well in excess of the cost that their consumption actually imposes. Now, some people weren't really worried about this for a long time. They said, well, that at least encourages people to conserve energy. That's changing though, because in California, like much of the world, we are increasingly focused on reducing greenhouse gases. And one of the ways to reduce greenhouse gases is to electrify activities that previously have been uh, fulfilled through burning fossil fuels. Uh, and California's grid these days produces about two thirds of its electricity with non GHG resources, wind, solar, nuclear power, hydroelectric and geothermal, and about a third with natural gas. Um, so uh, as we try to electrify more, we're going to, in order to reduce greenhouse gases, if we have very high prices, that's actually going to discourage electrification. So that's a concern. And in fact, we worry about high electricity prices for two reasons. One is this efficiency reason. If we put a lot of extra costs into electricity prices, that discourages efficient substitution towards electricity, and particularly efficient substitution away from other, uh, other energy sources, which are more polluting and uh, release more greenhouse gases. The other thing we're worried about is that higher electricity prices impose a large burden on low-income households, uh, an equity concern. Uh, it turns out energy in general and electricity in particular 
our, our consumption does not increase proportionally with income. Low income customers consume much more electricity relative to their income than uh, wealthier customers. And in fact, what we're finding is in California these days, across the income spectrum, household consumption of electricity is pretty much the same. Uh, that is household uh, consumption of electricity from the grid. Uh, and that's partially due to the fact that the very wealthiest households are disproportionately the ones installing rooftop solar. But it's also due to the fact that we started from a position where there wasn't that big a difference between low income and wealthy uh, customers. So we wanted to dig into this and figure out, well, why are rates so high if the marginal social marginal cost of, of providing electricity is so much lower? And we spent a lot of time digging through a lot of utility accounting and uh, uh, environmental accounting and so forth. And this is how we came up with the presentation of our results. So we refer to this as a waterfall graph. Um, it's got two staircases, not that waterfalls necessarily have staircases. The lower staircase corresponds to that marginal cost bar chart that I showed you before. We have generation, we have energy, we have the uh, capacity cost of generation that actually is marginal during peak times. We have the capacity cost of transmission that's actually marginal. We have the capacity cost of distribution. We have the pollution costs that the utility has to pay through California's cap and trade program. And those together add up to what we call the private marginal cost. Now, you could also add on the externalities that the utility doesn't have to pay for, uh, such as the additional greenhouse gases. California right now is pricing greenhouse gases at around $17 a ton. Um, the, Standard estimates are closer to $50 for the social cost of carbon. So we actually took that $50 uh, as the full cost. And this is the, the difference, this purple area. <coughs> but if what we're trying to figure out is how, do we, how does PG&E get to 26 cents a kilowatt hour, we go to the private marginal cost. And then we start looking at, well, what are the additional costs that aren't marginal? And what we found was there are things like the fixed cost of generation. Well, some of that is a incremental cost at peak times to provide capacity, but a lot of it is just costs that are never incremental. For instance, California signed a lot of contracts back in 2010 through 2015 that are turn out to be pretty expensive contracts. Now, when we first saw this, we thought, oh, this is California, this is those uh, expensive renewables California was buying when renewables were much more expensive. And it is partially, but it turns out it is equally the fossil fuel generation contracts that they were signing back then when fossil fuels, particularly natural gas was more expensive. So this actually reflects um, both renewables and fossil fuels. Transmission and distribution, well, this is a natural monopoly and a natural monopoly by definition has some fixed costs that uh, are not marginal uh, and that's reflected here. But there's more going on than that. And particularly in the distribution, but also in the, uh, in the transmission, we also, uh, what we're seeing is additional costs that are a result of climate change. Uh, we've had a lot of wildfires as Gordon referred to and as a result, we're spending a huge amount of money now uh, on, wild, on forest management, wildfire prevention uh, and uh, mitigation. Uh, and on uh, when we have had wildfires, the utilities have been, been found liable for some of the costs in some of which are not, can't be passed through to consumers, but some of which can. Then we also have various public purpose programs and we tried to break them out. There are things in here like energy efficiency. There is the payment that the other residential ratepayers are making for the low income. Although most of that is actually borne by commercial and industrial customers who we don't study in this um, paper. And then there's this brown area. And what this brown area is, is the share of these other fixed costs that are, at, that are added on in addition because 
of the customers who have installed behind the meter solar PV. So we started out just calculating as if that was the total universe and then recognizing that if there weren't these this production behind the meter, those customers would be buying those kilowatt hours from the utility. And when they did, they would be paying more of the fixed cost. As a result of the exit or the uh, load defection due to behind the meter solar, uh, that raises the rate somewhat. Uh, in the case of PG&E, it raises about three cents a kilowatt hour. We did these also for Southern California Edison, which has had much less solar uh, uh, build out or behind the meter solar build out. And for San Diego Gas and Electric, which has had much more. San Diego's, as I showed you in the Southern part of the state, great solar resource, lots of single family homes with good, re good roofs for it. And they've had a huge build out of rooftop solar. In fact, San Diego has about 20% rooftop solar penetration, which I know isn't quite to Australia, but uh, it's pretty competitive with it. Some people see this and say, okay, but what about dynamic pricing? Can't you solve this problem that way? Uh, we love dynamic pricing. Um, it's clearly an important part of reliability and cost control. Uh, we've written a lot of papers. I've written many papers on dynamic pricing and as have my co-authors. Um, and dynamic pricing is critical to making sure that the hourly variation in incremental cost is reflected in retail price. But importantly, dynamic pricing only addresses the lower staircase, that is the marginal cost. And that's all it should address. In fact, the whole theory of dynamic pricing is passing along the hourly marginal cost to customers. Um, it doesn't address that additional load we're putting on to the price of electricity by collecting all these fixed costs uh, through a volumetric price. And so dynamic pricing is definitely part of the solution, but it's not going to solve this problem of these additional costs that we have to recover. We took these estimates and we <clears throat> looked at the impact of ro the rooftop solar shift because the price is well above marginal cost when you could, when the customer who installs rooftop solar consumes less, that means somebody else has to pay not the full amount, but the amount that is non-marginal. That is the amount they, the customer would have paid towards those fixed costs. And we looked at that and we calculated how big is that cost shift. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, the San Diego has the biggest cost shift. If you are a customer in San Diego, who does not have rooftop solar, um, and you're not a low income customer, an average customer in San Diego is paying about $230 more per year for electricity than they would have uh, if everyone were consuming all their electricity from the grid. What's interesting is even the customers on low income programs are paying substantially more. And as a share of their income, these are much bigger numbers than uh, the, the share of the income for the customers who are not on the low income program. So what we did next is we looked into uh, how big a, or how, how big a cost shift is this to low income customers when we recover all of these costs through a volumetric charge. Now we're in the middle of this research project. We just recently got granular billing data from PG&E, the largest of the utilities that we're gonna to start to dig into. And we weren't able to incorporate that in this paper. But what we did do is we went to the consumer expenditure survey, which is a survey of, uh, of 30 or 40,000 customer or households in the United States of whom about 25 or 2,500 or 3,000 are in California. And we looked at those customers and asked, well, what share of, uh, or how does consumption change with uh, the wealth of the household? So along the bottom of this graph are the five income quintiles. These are the poorest households. And the fifth income quintile are the richest households. And what we did is for each of these, we compared expenditures or income of the, of the wealthier quintiles to the poorest quintile. So what we see here, for instance, is for consumption subject to the sales tax, 
that's the purple line. The households in the wealthiest uh, category are consuming about four and a half times more than households in the poorest category. For electricity, they're consuming about twice as much than households in the poorest category. Uh, for uh, even for gasoline, they're consuming about three times as much. And overall, their income of the wealthiest is about uh, is about 17 times higher than the poorest group. So what we see here is that it's clear that the poor, that when it comes to electricity, low income households are spending a much larger share of their income on uh, electricity than the wealthier households are. And what that means is that low income households who consume, and th these numbers, by the way, are from 2017. We actually are now looking at more recent data and it suggests that low income customers are now consuming about the same quantity of electricity as wealthy customers are. Now, if you're in the very poorest category and if some people in the second quintile are on this low income uh, program, which gives them somewhat lower rates uh, by law, about 30% lower. Um, but even with that, they're spending a much larger share of their income. And what we're essentially doing is putting a tax on electricity in order to cover all these fixed costs. Now, some of them are fixed costs related, directly related to providing electricity. A lot of them aren't. Uh, certainly climate change, responses to climate change, just this morning, by the way, there was an article in the local newspaper about how the state is gonna spend a lot more money uh, on a number of climate change responses as we have been hit, much of it wildfire, as we've been hit by uh, uh, extreme heat and drought. Interestingly, if those problems occur away from an electrical line, the state tends to pay for them through the state budget. If they occur due to an electrical line or have to, you have to mitigate due to an electrical line, they actually get paid for through our electrical bills through a volumetric charge. So essentially we're taxing electricity consumption to pay for infrastructure, climate change adaptation and public purpose programs. And at this point, uh, wealthier customers are consuming only slightly more net from the electricity grid than poorer households. In, then the implication is that this is a volumetric tax on electricity, and it's a very regressive tax, more regressive than gasoline, a gasoline tax or a sales tax. One solution would be to pay for state pro policy priorities to the state budget. And if I had more time, I would go through a number of examples of sort of parallel programs outside of electricity that are paid for the, the state budget. I'll give you one. We have low income programs for food and health care in California, both of which are paid for through the state budget. We also have a low income program for electricity that's paid for by increasing the charge for electricity for other customers. Alternatively, we could recover these costs through a fixed charge. Um, and I know in Australia, I, I believe I did a little research this afternoon that you have significant fixed charges. Um, these would be more significant than yours, as I'll show you in just a moment. And fixed chargers are also very regressive. Basically, they charge the same charge for every household if they, uh, if, they aren't, if they don't vary at all across households. And for that reason, uh, advocates for low-income households have opposed fixed charges historically. Uh, that's changing, and our proposal has tried to sort of figure out a way that allows us to lower volumetric rates to get more efficiency, while at the same time overcoming the equity problems that we're seeing with high volumetric rates and that we would also see if we had uh, uniform fixed charges. So we, ex we propose an income-based fixed charge. I'm not gonna spend time on how we actually describe the implementation, but we go through a lot of details about how one can exchange information between our tax authority and the utilities in ways that uh, respects uh, uh, the privacy of households, um, but I won't go into that today. And here's what we do. We say, well, if we had a uniform fixed charge, here's what it would be. It would be about $74 per household per month. This is for PG&E. We do this for all three utilities. 
Then we said, well, what if instead we lowered the fixed charge for the very poorest, the poorest quintile of customers to zero? And then we made the rest of the schedule as progressive as in one case, the sales tax, which most people still don't think is terribly progressive, or as, the, or as progressive as income. And just to be clear, this is as progressive as income, not as progressive as an income tax, which in California is in itself a progressive function of income. I'm gonna focus on the sales tax uh, just to move things along here. And what this yellow line shows is here is the fixed charge we would charge different households. If we had a income-based fixed charge that paid for all of that difference between social marginal cost and the full revenue requirement. Uh, and what we see is for households in the second quintile and third quintile, they'd see a fixed charge of roughly uh, 50 to $60, closer to $90 per month for households in the fourth quintile and about $150 per month for households in the very top quintile. Now, some people have seen that and said, wow, that's an eye-popping number. Uh, but, but you have to remember, you're also paying eight cents a kilowatt hour instead of 26 cents a kilowatt hour. And so you're saving 18 cents a kilowatt hour on your vol volumetric charge. So we looked at for an average consumption level, which is pretty accurate across here, how much would it change your monthly bill? Um, for the lowest income, it would lower it substantially. For the second quintile, well, if you were happen to be on the low income program and were on the second quintile, which some people are, it would raise your bill slightly. But you could, of course, adjust this. There's nothing magical about changing these fixed charges by the quintile so that that didn't happen. And in fact, it would have on average fairly little effect except for the highest quintile. And there the average effect would be an increase of about $65 per month. Um, but what we'd be doing is redistributing the cost, not of the actual cost of providing the electricity, but the cost of all those other fixed costs that are in the top uh, staircase, uh, including things like uh, transmission infrastructure, but also including things like wildfire mitigation, like programs to low-income programs, like uh, rooftop solar subsidies, et cetera. One reaction to this has been, won't this cause grid defection? Are people going to leave because of this? And the answer is that once you account for this volumetric price drop, the answer is pretty clearly no. In fact, if you think about, well, who might, who's going to see the biggest price increase? It's going to be very wealthy people who consume very little electricity from the grid. Now, either that's because they installed a bunch of solar or they live in very small dwellings um, and have few people in the household. And when you do that calculation um, and you say, well, what if a cu customer consumes a third of the average household consumption, their bill would increase by, and I noticed that this is about $120 a month under the progressive uh, sales tax. So, that would be imply that about a $1,400 a year increase in their electricity bill. Now they could leave for that, but even a 27 kilowatt hour battery to Tesla uh, power walls cost 15 to $20,000 to install. And I will tell you that a 27 kilowatt hour battery is not going to make you feel like you don't have to worry about the reliability of your electricity. In fact, once you have a couple of days without sun, you are out of electricity. So to wrap it up, California has, uh, the volumetric rates are very high relative to um, social marginal costs. California is the real outlier in the United States. In another paper I did with Jim Bushnell, we looked at that gap across the country. California is the worst, that is the biggest gap and in fact, other parts of the United States go the other direction. In the upper Midwest, where electricity is very cheap, the re retail prices are low, and it puts out a huge amount of pollution, not just CO2, but SO2 and causing acid rain, there the prices are actually too low. And uh, there they should be charging higher prices for electricity, which they could do very easily by lowering their monthly fixed charges. But in California, the rates are too high. This amounts to a very regressive tax. Um, 
as we've shown, uh, with negative implications for both efficiency, because we are discouraging electrification, those high prices make it much less attractive to put in a heat pump water heater, heat pump space heater, or an electric vehicle. In fact, just to give you one example, an electric vehicle that gets, th uh, that gets three miles to the kilowatt hour and is driven 12,000 miles a year, uh, is paying about $700 more per year for electricity for the EV than it would be paying if it were priced, if the price were at marginal, social marginal cost. So we look at changing the way costs are recovered to reduce electricity rates uh, and ensure affordability and put us on a path to decarbonization. In some ways, and when we started this project, we were thinking the answer is put more of this stuff onto the state budget that's become a less popular solution with the bigger budget problems the state has due to the pandemic, though not as bad as it looked like they were gonna be. Um, but another alternative is income-based fixed charges uh, that we show could lighten the burden of cost recovery on households that can least afford to pay while also lowering the volumetric price to reflect its true social marginal cost. So that's it, I will stop there and uh, Thank you very much for staying with that. And I'm happy to answer questions, as is Jim. Thank you very much, Severin. Um, so uh, a terrific presentation. What you will see, uh, it's a Q&A window. And uh, Jim's been kind of monitoring this uh, as he goes. But if I could just ask you, before you kind of select questions for answering, if you could just read it aloud uh, for, for, for the folks that can't see it. There was um, one I thought you might respond to about um, uh, Point me wholesale prices. Um, if no, the wholesale market operates on paying a cleaner price rather than a pay as bid dynamic price. Yeah. No, is that it? Yeah, you might want to hit that one because I wasn't, I, I thought you'd, I was sure you'd have a more thorough answer than me. Um, but then yeah. there's a few still open. Yeah, in equilibrium, if you uh, if you a pay as bid auction ends up paying the same price on average as a uh, uniform price auction, uh, so that that's not going to fundamentally solve the, uh, change the cost. Uh, the wholesale market uh, does pay a price that uh, includes lots of fixed costs, and those are in there. It's just that that doesn't include anywhere near the fixed costs that we're actually recovering. So if you go back and look at the waterfall graph, you see that there are capacity costs in there. And that is because at times the price is above the actual direct energy and uh, other marginal costs and helps to recover a lot of the fixed costs. But what we found um, is that uh, it's not even close. And I, I have to say that, you know, since 1999, I have been evangelizing for dynamic pricing and say, talking about how important it is. And I still think it is. But in the last few years, I've come to appreciate that in California, and this isn't true everywhere, but in California, we have a bigger problem than charging static rates. And that is that our rates are just completely out of line with marginal cost. Um, Boy, there are a lot of questions here. Uh, I can just start at the... So uh, there are a couple of questions in here on demand charges. Um, and I, this is a long, I don't wanna get too sidetracked. I've written a lot about demand charges. Um, demand charges that, Economists tend to look at them and think, oh, this is a really poor substitute for dynamic pricing. And it is to the extent that uh, because it charges for the customer's peak consumption, which doesn't necessarily correspond to the uh, system peak. But, um, but in fact, demand charges are mostly in commercial and industrial areas. And they're generally in the industry viewed as a substitute for fixed charges. So it's the idea is we want to charge people something that's not marginal, but it should scale with the size of the customer in some way. And so we'll make it a function of your peak usage. And that seems like it's sort of a way of imposing a fixed charge that scales. The problem is 
it's not really a fixed charge. There are things you can do to avoid it. And in fact, at least here, there are consulting firms that are in the business of coming in and teaching commercial industrial customers how to change their behavior to reduce their demand charges. Some of that is helpful. A lot of it is just inefficient installation of batteries and so forth to skim their own peak, not the system peak. Um, to the extent that it is efficient, it is because it looks more like dynamic pricing. And of course, as we just talked about, if we had dynamic pricing, that would be great, but it wouldn't solve this cost recovery problem. Um, well, maybe I will just uh, start at the beginning and work from, or maybe that's the end actually. Uh, boy, there are a lot of them. Um, Daryl Bigger, hi Daryl. Uh, we have emailed many times. Can you confirm that your marginal cost calculation includes a contribution arriving from congestion on transmission distribution networks? Yes, we can. Um, and so that, that's in there. That is what that capacity calculation is doing. It is actually taking the calculation of the incremental uh, capacity need and allocating it over the peak hours. Now, the exact way you allocate it over the peak hours is uh, somewhat arbitrary if you can't solve the full demand model. Um, but in some ways that doesn't matter once you aggregate back up. And so uh, in aggregate, we're pretty sure it's right. Uh, this means that in some years, by the way, there's plenty of capacity and there's no congestion on the system or not much on the transmission. And, and in general, there isn't much on the distribution system. Uh, we build distribution systems to, uh, be, to have plenty of capacity. Once you dig the trench in a neighborhood, you put in a gigantic wire. Now, it turns out as we go forward and we have a lot of electric vehicles and maybe more air conditioning, that may not be gigantic enough. And then we may face that, but we're not there yet. Um, have you considered charging a network fee for solar exports? I actually, Kelly Cott asked, I actually have written a blog about this. Um, and the answer is you can do that, but as batteries have gotten cheaper, the problem is that if we try to just fix the solar problem, it's going to be increasingly cost-effective for customers not to grid defect, not to cut the cord, but to stop exporting power into the grid by putting in a battery and holding the power behind the, the meter in order not to get charged that fee. And I wrote a blog about this in January that actually runs through some calculations. Uh, and my memory is that in California, where obviously that gap is huge, um, you, you can save something like $700 a month. Uh, for by uh, putting in ba a battery to just one Tesla battery to hold the power, most of the power you produce behind the meter. Leslie Martin. Hi, Leslie. I don't know if it's the same in electricity, but for road use, the two low income groups look very different. How much they contribute to congestion road charges. So the disaggregation might be interesting if you have the data. Yeah, um, we're working on this. Uh, unfortunately, the data we have from the consumer expenditure survey aren't really, it's just, there just isn't a huge sample. And the individual data, which we now have, don't have income. And so we're working on, and I've written some papers in the past on how to match those to income. Jim, did you want to add anything to you that? That's your sort of. No, I don't think so. I mean, I, uh, I think that's right. I mean, I, I think a challenge is going to actually also be thinking about the elasticity, which I think Leslie's alluding to there. It, to the extent that it differs across groups will also affect the welfare calculation, which is hard to get at, but yeah. um, is, is likely true. So it's, it's a point well taken, Leslie, if nothing else. Tim Ryan says, are you aware of how Australian local governments collect uh, their revenues, it's called rates, in quote. Simply, the rate is based on the unimproved land value. Um, it seems like a good methodology. It sure does, uh, a, a land tax. Uh, in California, we actually, unfortunately, have a law that uh, greatly restricts the ability to use any sort of property tax. And if that weren't there, that would probably be our first choice that for, um, 
for recovering these. We've had some discussions with people about whether it would violate the law if the utility was basing charges instead of calling it tax. And maybe it's possible, but uh, I have a feeling that it, that is even, given that that law restricting property taxes is still very popular for reasons that I still can't fathom, um, the, the, it would be very different, unlikely you'd get that through. Um, Farhad asks, how would performance be monitored for fixed charges to ensure that utilities are being compensated appropriately? Um, I mean, that, i.e. making sufficient and efficient investment, that's, that's the problem that we face now. I'm not sure that changes much with the, with, uh, the way we collect those fixed charges. Um, we still have to regulate the utilities. We still have to do uh, an analysis of prudency. And I think that would continue to be the case. Leslie Martin asks again, uh, Leslie, by the way, is a UC Berkeley uh, PhD who uh, is doing great work also on the electricity system. Income-based fixed charges sound like a lot like something that should be addressed at a state income tax level. Yeah. Are these utility-based income charges much easier to implement politically? Who would be voting on this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, the sad truth is nothing's going to be easy to implement politically. But I, I, I mean, I would say, you know, part of um, what we did, what, part of what we emphasize is that some of the things we're recovering are costs that are, you know, the form are, are forms of climate mitigation and climate adaptation. And that's exactly things that we normally pay for through the state income tax um, in other domains, but some of it is being recovered through the utilities. Um, and so we kind of appeal to that just as your question implies to make the argument that at least some costs um, certainly should be um, or have been in, in other domains or are covered um, through income or, or sales tax uh, revenue, um, which is you know partly how we make a case for the plausibility of this. In the paper, we kind of just lay out the argument, you could shift more of it onto the state budget directly um, and we started the project and um, before uh, the pandemic uh, in a time when California was expecting to be running a substantial budget surplus and the original <laughs> impetus was like hey why don't you use some of that surplus to pay for some of these charges bring down the cost of electricity and make the system fair um, the budgetary situation looked a little more dire for a while there and so we um, in, in, to a large degree moved our emphasis towards thinking these things are going to stay on energy bills, um, but uh, you know it could go either way. Uh, um, uh, we're happy for it to be recovered in either of these do domains, and I think both of them are difficult. Um, but switching to a land tax is probably uh, a whole different problem uh, because of um, restrictions in California and property taxation. So George Jose asks, if the optimal ratio of income-based fixed charges and volumetric charges depends on social costs of pollution and natural disasters, social programs, et cetera, that will vary across the country. It certainly will. Is there a nice way to monitor and update fixed prices, fixed charges, I assume that means, based on these factors? Yeah, no, the, it would require this sort of in-depth analysis in every system, and it's a lot of work. Uh, and it's not as big a problem in most states as it is in California. California has the largest gap in either direction between price and social marginal costs that anywhere in the country. And so in some ways, I think this is a bigger problem here. Um, that's partially because California has chosen to implement a lot of social programs, not just uh, subsidies for low income and rooftop solar, but also um, a lot of, uh, early investments in renewables and R&D and uh, uh, infrastructure for EV charging and so forth, and pay for all of those through uh, electricity prices rather than through the state budget. Uh, no other state is really doing nearly as much of that, so they don't have as big a gap. But it's a challenge. Um, and I think trying to get prices to really reflect social marginal cost is going to be a challenge. Uh, it's you know, in some ways, it was much less of a problem uh, to the economists in the group, in the crowd that, you know, if we have very inelastic demand, we don't have much dead weight loss from charging bad prices. Uh, and what's happened is we've come to the point where demand is much more elastic and people have more choices to between 
uh, ways of using energy and ways of generating energy than they used to. And so uh, the inefficiency from mispricing electricity has gone way up. And you know that, that it's not only a result of the need to address climate change, uh, but that's the place where it really shows up uh, the most. Gene asks, how would household electricity storage affect the, affect the prices? Well, I, I guess I'll answer the opposite question, uh, which is how would the prices affect household electricity storage? Um, I think that if you actually adopted our system, uh, the incentives for installing household storage would be much smaller because you wouldn't have this incentive to avoid net metering laws. Uh, in fact, you could continue with net metering uh, because if the price truly reflects social marginal cost, you're paying people the real value of the solar that they're injecting into the grid. Um, if, the, if houses do store a lot, um, that smooths out prices um, and we get less volatility, less dynamic changes in the prices. Um, and that would be fine um, as long as that storage is being installed for efficient incentives not to essentially avoid the inefficient incentives. You might want to skip two down. Severin Kelly Court had a follow-up on her battery question from earlier. I Kelly, incentivizing battery uptake is not a bad thing and we're reducing increasing costs to the network. Well, incentivizing battery uptake efficiently is not a bad thing, but big batteries, it turns out, are a lot more efficient than tiny batteries. And so the question is, do we install the batteries on the grid at the megawatt scale, or do we install them behind the meter at the kilowatt scale? Um, if you do the math, and if there's no particular value in having it down at the customer, which there may be, and I'll get back to in a second, then it's pretty clearly more economic to do them at the grid scale, because the big batteries are just much more cost effective. Now, it may be the case that on some circuits, having batteries down at the end of the circuit, that is behind the meter at the customer, it doesn't have to be behind the meter, but down at the end of the circuit, can avoid distribution congestion, particularly, for instance, this problem I mentioned, if everybody's plugging in their electric vehicle at the same time and the distribution circuit wasn't built for that. Um, that could be a good thing. Um, and we should be charging prices that actually, or giving incentives that actually correctly incentivize that. But you know, just like rooftop solar isn't necessarily the best solution to decarbonizing if there are other types of uh, solar or renewables that can do it, um, behind the meter batteries aren't necessarily the best place to put batteries uh, if there are other places that can do it more cost effectively. Um, Tim Ryan asks, what do you think of the view that all networks should be covered via subscription? This is an interesting issue. Um, and it depends what you mean by subscription. Uh, you could base it on a capacity metric or an income metric, as you said. Um, the capacity metric looks a little like a demand charge, but it's sort of a ex ante demand charge instead of an ex post, a, a prospective demand charge. And that certainly isn't efficient. People are still gonna have an incentive, for instance, to overinstall batteries to reduce their subscription, but it may be a solution that's a less bad solution. It's certainly likely to be less bad than demand charges or than this volumetric approach. Um, Claire Stark. Claire Stark asks, is it appropriate then to include policy implementation, heat and tariffs, bushfire mitigation costs, to in energy prices, social costs? Should more work be done to encourage governments to move these costs out of energy charges? Policy implementation like feed in tariffs for rooftop solar, bushfire mitigation are not marginal costs of my consumption of electricity. When I go to turn on the light or charge my EV or whatever, it doesn't impose higher costs for feed-in tariffs or bushfires. So, but in economic incentive terms, you would not want to put those in prices. Now you do want to put all of the truly incremental costs, including the 
additional pollution caused by my consuming electricity. Um, but things like feed-in tariffs and bushfire mitigation, or what we are calling wildfire mitigation, they're pretty much equivalent, um, are best paid for outside of the volumetric electricity price. You can do it through fixed charges, um, and that would be uh, a one way to do it. Uh, we, if the fixed charges are not income-based, that's likely to look pretty regressive. So another possibility is to do it through income-based fixed charges or to move it on to the government, uh, the, uh, government budget, which uh, I think is a, for many of the programs we're talking about in California, it's just so easy to find parallels in other industries that do pay for them through the state budget. And the reason that they're not being paid for in electricity through the state budget, in my opinion, is political. It's just really easy to mandate a low income program, a rooftop solar subsidy program, and say, just pay for it through the bills. And so that's what the politicians in California have done. Um, trying to find somebody new here who um, maybe pick your, your your favorite remaining one or two questions, Severin, and then we'll uh, wrap okay, this one well, up. Thank you. I, I'm not sure I can tell what's my favorite. <laughs> reading well. So I, I think I'll, Thomas Brinsmead. In retrospect, I can ask Marcy how would po how politically saleable is introducing a scheme that is progressive relative to the status quo? In practice, would you expect a lot of pushback from politically influential wealthier citizens? Are the relevant decision makers more likely to be sympathetic to more progressive utility cost recovery approach? This is such a Jim question. I'm gonna. Well, I guess I'll just say. I mean, the one thing that we I'm did in the report. Your great work on this too. Uh, well, well, I'll just say that the, the thing that we did in the report was um, uh, we the the there's one figure where Severin showed the rate structure of a hypothetical scheme that had these five different income bins, and and to get that, what we did was we figured out. I think as Severin said. We figured out what, you know, a, a, a system that recovered rates in a way that was similarly progressive to the sales tax in California um, would do. And then we compared, um, uh, uh, we, we built a, a set of rates that would look like that. Um, and then we did the same thing with something that, that was um, sloped with the income distribution in California, which is what we'd be recovering if we had a flat income tax. And in fact, we have a relatively progressive income tax in California at the state level. Um, so we're recovering um, funds in an even more progressive way than that through the income tax. So in our view, it's, you know, the political economy is challenging, but that's, that's the way we recover other costs uh, in the state. And that's the equilibrium that we've reached politically as a way to balance um, equity concerns um, when raising revenue for other purposes. And so we think it makes a lot of sense to show what the utility system would look like pegged to those same benchmarks. Um, so that's sort of punting on what's really saleable. Um, but I think in California, we are at a moment where there's an appreciation that we, the status quo um, of the rate structure can't persist. Um, and there's increasing uh, conversation that we need to change something. Um, and there's a strong desire among many constituents to find a rate reform that's also equitable um, and so what we'd love to get is a rate reform that's equitable and efficient at the same time. Um, and we think, you know, uh, some combination of moving some of the costs back to the state budget um, and introducing a fixed charge that can be efficient but can be designed to be progressive is a really appealing way. So we're hoping um, some other people will agree with us. And I will just close by saying uh, Jim's too modest to talk about. He's done some really important work on figuring out how to compensate losers and in these sorts of policy changes and how difficult it is. And I would strongly recommend that. We, we have talked about this proposal. I presented it to the regulator in California a few weeks ago. Meredith presented it in a webinar. Um, so we've been talking to, about, to a lot of people and we've actually gotten pretty widespread support. The big utilities are very interested in it. They, they've been pushing for fixed charges for a long time. Um, the consumer advocates, uh, particularly the advocates for low income households are very interested in it. Um, we've gotten interest from the regulator. Uh, and so I'm optimistic would be too strong, but I think that this is a, a policy change worth discussing. It's certainly something people recognize that uh, we're, we have a real problem. And 
California, the regulator came out with a white paper a couple of weeks ago that showed that over the next 10 years, because of uh, climate change largely, uh, our electricity rates are expected to increase by about, I think it was 3% above inflation um, for, uh, for the next 10 years. So this problem is gonna get worse by quite a bit over the next decade. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Severin. This, uh, I'm sure you can see from, we still have unanswered questions has just uh, been a ter terrific service, I guess, uh, for, for many of us here here in Australia. And I, I stimulate a lot of thought and discussion. Um, so there's just one question at the end. Severin and Jim's report, it, it's it's available. I'm pretty sure we've got the link to it on, on, on the seminar webpage. But I, I believe if you were to Google next 10, uh, designing rates that probably get you half the way there and whack a Borenstein in the end. And I'm sure you'd, you'd definitely get there. And in fact, uh, that, that reminds me that I should thank Next 10, which is a nonprofit that we had some discussions with about this issue and they uh, actually supported the work on this issue. It's a great organization. Sorry. No, of course. Uh, thank you, Severin. And, and, and yeah, um, and, and actually a, a slight plug for, for the Australian Energy uh, Electricity Market Initiative. If there are any partners that would be uh, interested in conducting a similar study for Australia, and as you see, there is quite a lot of uh, background work that needs to get involved, please be in touch. Um, we've obviously got tremendous colleagues on the, on the other side of the, uh, the Pacific as well who, who, who have provided a template for something that I think could uh, have substantial input into future policy. Um, but, but once more, I just want to say thanks so much, uh, Severin and Jim. This, was, this has been tremendous, and we're, we're very happy to have hosted you and, 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 and uh, wish you all the best for the rest of the year. Thank you. Thank you all for Thank coming. You.